Konnichiwa. Former Minister of Defense Morimoto, Admiral Kawano, Rear Admiral Egawa, Mr. Tsunami, Mr. Brewster, Mr. Sidal, other distinguished guests. It is my distinct pleasure and privilege to address this audience and panel of esteemed maritime colleagues and partners and to offer thoughts on how sea power in the 21st century ought to be. I'd like to thank the Ministry of Defense and the Sasakawa Peace Foundation Ocean Policy Research Institute for hosting this event and for the opportunity to speak here today. Australia, India, Japan, and the United States all have a mutual and vital interest in maritime security in the Indo-Pacific, which has fast become the epicenter for the global economy. As you've heard from some of our previous panels, approximately 60% of maritime trade passes through Asia, with the South China Sea carrying an estimated one-third of global shipping. Equally important to the flow of goods is the flow of services, which travel around the world electronically as bits and bytes. Clearly, today's world is more interconnected than ever before. And increasingly, it is the oceans and the trade that flows above and below the sea that links our global community together, making maritime security a topic of the highest priority, particularly in this area of the world. The commitment of our four nations to maritime security is why we routinely work together, train together, and participate in scores of bilateral and multilateral exercises every year. Just last week, ships, aircraft, and submarines from Japan, India, and the United States converged upon Sasebo in Kyushu for Exercise Malabar, right on the heels of Talisman Sabre, the bilateral Australian-US training exercise held along the eastern coast of Australia in July. We continue to be committed to collaboration and cooperation, both in field training exercises and in academic forums such as this one, where both experienced and young bright minds gather to share perspectives and strategic thinking as we strive to maintain security and stability in the Indo-Pacific. The U.S. maritime vision is to uphold our shared values for a safe, secure, prosperous, and free Indo-Pacific in concert with allied, allies and partner nations. We endeavor to achieve this by ensuring respect for the sovereignty and independence of every nation, no matter the size, by freedom for all nations wishing to transit international waters and airspace, by peaceful dispute resolution without coercion, and finally, by adherence to the rules-based international order, which has been underwriting prosperity throughout the Indo-Pacific for the last seven decades. The unceasing presence of U.S. ships, aircraft, and submarines in the Indo-Pacific over the last 75 years has safeguarded the rules-based international order. On any given day, in the Seventh Fleet area of responsibility, there are between 50 and 70 ships and submarines, 140 aircraft, and approximately 20,000 sailors and marines. In addition, our force posture is supplemented by the deployment of rotational U.S.-based aircraft carriers and expeditionary strike groups, adding more than 20 ships and submarines to the Western Pacific to address operational needs and critical gaps. But let's be clear, we have no illusions about being able to patrol and safeguard the 100 million square miles that comprise the Indo-Pacific on our own. The Department of Defense released our National Defense Strategy in January 2018. It uses the word allies 124 times. It is exceptionally telling of our shared dependence on one another. Every day, we seek ways to enhance our military presence by strengthening treaty alliances, building new partnerships, advancing multilateral cooperation, improving interoperability, and increasing our readiness to respond to crises. 
As an illustration of this commitment, in my own command at Submarine Group 7, we have added both JMSDF and Australian Liaison Officers. And just next week, we will host the Indian Navy for theater anti-submarine staff talks in Yokosuka. My peers in the other branches and components, maritime, air, ground, space, and cyber, have similarly worked to expand our bilateral and multilateral relationships and integrate our training and operations. Mutually beneficial alliances and partnerships are crucial to our national defense strategy providing a durable, asymmetric, strategic advantage that no competitor or rival can match. U.S. 7th Fleet also works in tandem with our combined and joint force commanders to ensure our airmen, marines, soldiers, and sailors are provided the best training and equipment to defend our shared national interests. To that end, and to support our ability to execute national tasking and meet national objectives in the Indo-Pacific, there have been substantial investments in maritime forces operated by 7th Fleet. You are aware of many, but in quick succession, we have stationed and deployed fourth and fifth generation airframes to the region, bolstering our aviation capabilities to include the EA-18G Growler, the reconnaissance and patrol aircraft P-8 Poseidon, the Airborne Early Warning and Control Aircraft E-2D Advanced Hawkeye, and the F-35B Joint Strike Fighter. We will also add to our fleet here in the next year the Navy's newest flat deck amphibious assault ship, the F-35 capable USS America, and the amphibious landing platform dock USS New Orleans. In the past four years, more advanced surface vessels, including destroyers, Benfold, Barry, and Milius were added to our fleet, boasting the newest Aegis combat system, Baseline 9, which strengthens ballistic missile defense capabilities available to the region. 60% of our attack submarines are stationed in the Pacific, and the USS Ronald Reagan, one of the Navy's most modern aircraft carriers and the world's only forward deployed aircraft carrier, is here in Yokosuka. A fundamental question, though, that has plagued every level of government, diplomatic, informational, military, and economic, is this. Will the U.S. and our allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific be able to maintain maritime superiority and project sea power in this new era of great power competition? Currently, and more so than at any time since the end of World War II, the Indo-Pacific security environment is increasingly contested. The security challenges in this region transcend traditional military-on-military -military competitions. In today's dynamic security environment, with multiple challenges from state and non-state actors, often fed by social disorder, political upheaval, and technological advancements, that fundamental question is now even more relevant. Well, I would ask us to consider this. We have all benefited from the strong maritime security networks and through the assistance of our allies and partners over the past 75 years, the Indo-Pacific has been one of the world's great success stories. Completely transformed since the end of World War II, the region is now home to the world's three largest economies and seven of the eight fastest growing economies. Although the region also contains seven of the, of the world's ten largest military forces, including North Korea, it has experienced decades of relative peace and stability. This has facilitated an increase in prosperity unmatched in human history. The prolonged period of regional stability has been underwritten for the last 70 plus years, in part due to unfettered, unfettered naval presence sustained by a strong network of alliances and partnerships. The United States' current national military strategy, promulgated in 2018, is based on the defense objectives of the national defense strategy. It acknowledges the vital contributions of allies and partners, a strategic source of our strength for both the joint force and our Navy. 
It also highlights the need for a strong, agile, and resilient force through interoperability and the combat lethality and survivability of our allies and partners. The Chief of Naval Operations has released a design for maintaining maritime superiority 2.0 shortly after the release of the National Military Strategy to ensure that we maximize the Navy's contribution to the objective set forth in national level strategic documents. Again, one of the most distinct lines of effort that he articulated in the design was expand and strengthen our network of partners. My belief is that a strong commitment to a free and open sea lanes has not lost its relevance among Indo-Pacific nations. We value stability. Our combined sea power continues to be the critical foundation of that stability and prosperity throughout the region. So even with the threat of rising and revisionist powers, we will remain focused on preserving the rules-based order while enhancing the stability that binds its existing network of allies and partners. Again, it has been a distinct honor and privilege to speak to you today. Thank you very much. Arigato gozaimasu.